Hello, Hello, and thank you for joining uh, COPA Safety Seminar tonight. It's on weather briefings. I'm Sharon Chung, Program Director at COPA. It's a pleasure to welcome you all back from a, uh, a short summer hiatus that we had. If you're just joining us tonight, uh, and, and you were able to get some flying hours in the summer. As you're introducing yourselves in the chat, let us know where you recently flew. We do have a lot to cover uh, tonight. So out of respect for your time, I'm gonna jump right into it. I have with me today, two fellow COPA senior managers, Jim Ferrier and Neil Bennett. So Jim, our association has had some changes in the last few months. Welcome today, and uh, as a result of these changes, you're now joining us with a new title and position. Um, welcome to today's seminar. Could you tell us uh, what members could... Office leadership, obviously, but uh, really the the course stays the same as we had before. Uh, you know, we, we've had some real good developments over the course of the last couple of years. Good example of that is, of course, exactly what we're doing now is these safety seminars. So uh, that that has been a big focus from uh, COPA nationally uh, over the last couple of years is, is the safety focus. And that's really going to sort of remain the number one thing that we're we're, we're focused on over the course of the next uh, next few months and years, of course. Uh, of course, additional to that, uh, COPA obviously uh, monitoring and watching industry events and things that are going on. Uh, outside of, uh, of, of our control, uh, government, NAV Canada, uh, medicals, things like that. So uh, we have a lot of advocacy issues on the go. And that's one of the reasons we have Neil here tonight. Uh, he's, he's the one handling now uh, those issues inside COPA. So uh, he'll probably have a little bit of input on those, which uh, we continue to monitor like that for people to, to draw on in the past. And we, we really want to look at how we can expand that and, and really make COPA membership uh, something even more worthwhile than it is now. So with that, I think that's the top three things, but I'll add a little teaser onto the end of the discussion in that uh, we did have some good news uh, recently uh, that I can't actually disclose right at the moment, but uh, it, it falls in line in particular with uh, with with the safety and promoting safety culture. So uh, we're hoping in the next month or so, we're going to be able to have a big announcement that I think uh, members will will see as a big opportunity for COPA and uh, and, and a real benefit uh, for you all out there. Um, so stand by for that. And, and with that, I'll pass it back to Sharon. Well, folks in the, uh, the marketing biz, we call that a good teaser. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you're, you're just, uh, Keep, keep track of our, our marketing channels, more to come. I, I am seeing some, all her tireless work of, of leading the organization towards that chapter. Uh, you had mentioned a little bit about Neil's work. So over to Neil, yeah, I'm sure some of you uh, have are familiar with Neil. He's no stranger to our community. So I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and some of uh, the, the work that uh, our members can expect from you. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Neil Bennett. I'm the new director of external relations with COPA. Thanks to Sharon for organizing the event and Conrad for presenting. I think you guys are going to enjoy this very, very much. Uh, so as has been indicated, I've been back in my role now for about a month and a half. So I've been pedaling pretty hard to get up to speed on most, the majority of the advocacy issues. As Jim stated, uh, big ones are looking at uh, access to airspace for our members, the wording in the NOTAMs that has been causing some issues and confusion as well as dealing with Transport Canada CIVAP with uh, medical issues and files for members that are unable to renew their medical or are struggling to have their files reviewed. So working closely with them to try to remove part of the backlog and uh, see what else we can do to try and help the notices to explain a little bit more of that. We are still a ways away from having that here in Canada as is it is in the US. So uh, still work to be done with regard to the infrastructure for getting those sort of things. But dealing with a lot of things like that, and as I said, pedaling pretty fast to get up to speed on the working groups, uh, some of the RPAS stuff uh, that, that's ongoing and items of that. So looking to meet some people here in the next little while and uh, help along the, the causes that need to be pushed down the road. So, hi. So Sharon, you're, I, you seem to be either muted or we're experiencing the same problems that many are saying in the chat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, 
no, this is very much 2022. I, <laughs> I, I was muted. Thanks very much for that, uh, that introduction, Neil. And we're very excited to, to have you on the team and to see some of the work that you're going to uh, achieve. I, I am getting a little nervous with some of the commentary here. To, so I'm going to do a quick check with the three of uh, you, Jim, Neil, and, and Conrad. Is, are, is your sound okay? We, I've, I've experienced no issues at all since the beginning. It's the preferred or optimal uh, um, browser to use. Uh, if it re is really choppy, maybe try off of your phone and you might be get better signal from there. Uh, and, and I'll work with you to get through that. Now, tonight's seminar, it does qualify for the 24 months pilot recurrent training requirements of the CARS, of course. I will uh, put all the details of what you need to record in your logbook into the chat, so keep an eye out for that. But essentially, it's the, the name of the seminar, the date, uh, and uh, Conrad's name. So please uh, include that in your logbook if you'd like to, uh, to have that recorded. The, we will be sending out certificates so that you can have that as a keepsake as well. Now, I know you see Conrad. We will soon hear from Conrad, who's a, a good friend to COPA. Um, and throughout the event, we will take breaks. Uh, we will hear from SiriusXM, who's one of our sponsors for the program. They help keep these seminars nice and free. We will also have uh, a short presentation from one of our newest sponsors, Zolio. You might see them coming in and out. Uh, we're going to reserve that for the end of the seminar so that we can keep to the meat of the presentation for today, but please do stick around. So, uh, Zolio is a satellite communications uh, device business. So if you're in the market for uh, some kind of search and rescue or, or GPS type of tool, uh, they, they may have some useful information to you. I personally use them uh, for non-aviation related trip this year through a, a backcountry camping trip and, and it was a pretty smooth experience for me. So uh, I think we're ready to jump in. Uh, so Conrad, I, I suppose I, I now welcome you to start your, your presentation. Uh, if you could introduce yourself first. Well, uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, so Sharon uh, dropped it on me about, you know, 15 minutes ago that I had to give a short bio on myself. So I'll do that. Um, I've been around aviation for a long time as an instructor and a, I was a Transport Canada inspector for a while. I've done a little airline flying, a little corporate flying, spent a lot of time as a pilot examiner and, and lately doing a lot of uh, online teaching through uh, Hangar Inc., which is a company that I co-founded. So I do this kind of thing um, often, and uh, hopefully what we have tonight is going to be of interest to people. What's going to happen is uh, I'm going to turn my video off here and I'll be bringing up the, uh, the uh, presentation. And uh, if uh, there are any comments, uh, hopefully uh, Sharon will be able to uh, intercept them and pass them over to me. So let's uh, just give it a second here. I'm going to uh, turn my screen share on. And there we go. Okay, so the uh, the idea behind this uh, particular topic uh, is to look at some of the, the newer flight planning tools. And I'm sure that uh, some of you out there have used some of this stuff. Um, so I'm, you know, thinking about things like uh, for flight, flight plan go, and but, you know, there are also other tools out there. And I'm sure that a lot of you are very well versed in, uh, in using these types of uh, newer tools. But I've come up with really three objectives. So, uh, you know, one is we want to provide pilots with, a, I've got the word refresher in quotation marks, because uh, many of you may not have even thought about using these kind of tools for, for flight planning. And we'll look at different flight planning tools, not everything that's uh, that's out there and available. And I, I'll, I'll right off the bat say that this is not a course on how to use for flight or flight plan go. It's really uh, the 101 version of just making people aware of, uh, of what's out there. 
Um, also talk a little bit about uh, hazardous weather and how we can use some of the technology to avoid it. And then, you know, weather tools for just getting yourself a, uh, a an up-to-date weather briefing. So a question that I get asked all the time is, you know, why are we even talking about this? Like, don't pilots get trained on this stuff? And, you know, the, the answer is that uh, in basic pilot training, we really focus on the licensing requirements, right? It's if you're a flying instructor, it's it's really just enough to get your student through uh, the requirements to get a license. And right now we do have a bias towards what I call the old school methods. So old school methods mean, um, you know, calling flight service to get a weather briefing like we did in 1980, uh, back when I had hair and, uh, and uh, filing a flight plan over the telephone. And, you know, certainly there's a place for that. The other thing is that in many flying schools, uh, new technology may not be available in the school. And if the students are not made aware of it, then they maybe won't go out and get it themselves. Now, many of them find all of this stuff online and, you know, you can, uh, you can educate yourself. But another problem we have is that the instructors that are in these flying schools, a lot of them are new and they may not be uh, proficient in using the, uh, the flight planning and, and weather tools that are available because they've just come through the training system where it wasn't emphasized. So it becomes a little bit of a, of a self-fulfilling prophecy that um, you know this stuff isn't, isn't available. So one good example is that uh, the way we train people to do flight planning is largely manual. So, you know, we've still got people drawing pencil lines and um, and drift lines and all of that stuff that you learned in private pilot ground school. We still require paper maps on flight tests. So this is right in the in the flight test guide that you need to have a paper map and be able to do this on a, on a paper map. And the result is that in basic flight training, we're probably not doing things much different than we were, you know, circa 1950. So that's a, you know, that's a problem. I mean, <laughs> in, in some flying schools, it's it's even a big deal to have an electronic flight calculator. You know, we're still using an E6B or something like that. Um, and, you know, that's that's fine, but there is more out there. And that's the purpose of this of this presentation. So another example is uh, is weather briefing or, or weather information. And um, what I have learned from the work that I do is that a lot of pilots really only learn very basic, almost cursory um, weather skills. So most new pilots are gonna know the Nav Canada website. You know, instructors are pretty good about pointing them towards that. Um, but many of them are not familiar with any any flight planning or uh, websites or apps such as as for flight or or flightplan.com flight plan go app these are tools that are available and you know there are other ones out there but um, i would say these are probably the two most popular most prevalent ones so one thing that a lot of people don't know including a lot of pilot examiners because uh, they don't read the guide, is that for a while now, pilots have been permitted to use flight planning software on all flight tests. Uh, this is probably seven, eight years back where it's been it's been permitted. Um, the one thing that goes with that, however, is that the examiner may still ask for you to plan a leg manually just to prove that you can do it. And uh, I find that other than the instrument rating flight test, most candidates just don't take advantage of it. So you've still got people that are, are doing all of their flight planning uh, manually. I don't know whether it's, uh, it's, it's ignorance or maybe instructors just feel like they want to make sure that their candidates can, uh, can perform it manually. But we, we have had this provision for a number of years. And very seldom on a private or commercial flight test will I see that somebody is taking advantage of it. Instrument rating, 
I think by the time somebody gets their instrument rating, they're tired of using their E6B. So we do tend to see it a little bit more. So what this means is that um, the expertise in using the modern tools has been really slow to come around. And a lot of times what I have observed is that people sort of learn this on their own. And so it's learned informally and, uh, you know, from a YouTube video or a chat room or, or something like that. And that may not be the best way to, uh, to learn the material. Um, the other issue is that, you know, manual flight planning can be tedious. Um, you know, I, I do it regularly in flying school and I find it tedious and I can do it fairly quickly. But somebody who is, uh, you know, just wants to go on a, on a fun flight uh, may not bother to do it. And that means that now we're affecting our, our safety or we're affecting our utility. And what I mean by that is maybe if flight planning is a pain, somebody doesn't really take a trip that's at all challenging or, or maybe interesting. And I think that's, that's a real shame. And the other thing is that it, maybe it's the reason why some people just drop out of flying because... Uh, you know, you can only you can only fly 50 miles for a hamburger so many times. And, you know, if you've got efficient and safe flight planning, it just makes it a lot more interesting and, and uh, takes a, a lot of the uh, the tedium and the bother out of it. So. What I want to do now is look at some of these 21st century tools and and, you know, what are we actually talking about here? And there are a number of things that some of you may be aware of. Some of you may not be. Maybe that's why you're checking this out. But um, really, I just want you to start thinking about it and maybe go and investigate, you know, some of this stuff. I consider that every pilot should have a basic toolbox. So if, uh, if it was up to me, everybody would have a computer tablet. Now the iPad was adopted very quickly into uh, into aviation. It turns out now you don't need to buy an iPad. You can do it with uh, with any uh, any tablet. You probably want to have a flight planning uh, flight planning software or an app. And I think what's also really important is you have some kind of in flight weather system. And we'll talk about all of this stuff in a little bit of detail. But I would consider this sort of the basic uh, toolbox. People come to me all the time and say, like, what kind of stuff should I, you know, should I invest in? And I tell them this. And, uh, you know, probably the only other thing that I would add that's not related to this presentation is maybe a backup handheld radio, you know. And then you you can, after that, you can buy whatever junk you want. But this this I would consider to be basic for somebody flying around in the 21st century, who's going to do any kind of serious flying? So let's talk about the tablet. Um, you can pretty much run flight planning or weather software on any tablet now. As I said before, uh, the iPad was adopted early. And in the early years of this, a lot of these uh, applications wouldn't run on anything but an iPad. And the complaint we got was, iPads are expensive. This uh, Samsung tablet that I have was, you know, 150 bucks. Why won't it work? Well, now, now it'll probably work. Um, and uh, we don't find now that somebody has to invest eight or nine hundred dollars in an iPad. Um, and the other thing is, you don't necessarily need the um, tablet that has, you know, the highest maximum capacity. So you can get away with an inexpensive tablet. As far as flight planning uh, software or apps, there are, as I said, a number of choices. And um, and again, we're not here to champion one over the other. Uh, I have found with uh, you know my students and the people that I work with, uh, flightplan.com and ForeFlight are, are two of the most popular ones for Canadian pilots. A lot of the other ones out there, um, either don't have Canadian coverage or they don't work particularly well in Canada. And again, I, I'm not speaking for all of them, but I know that these two are two that are, are popular and that a lot of people use and use effectively and they work. Um, so 
This is not to knock anybody else's uh, software or flight planning. So no matter what system you choose, you should be able to do a number of things. Uh, you know, you should be able to check weather and they all have, you know, a lot of different ways you can you can do that. And it requires you spend a little bit of a uh, little bit of time in your armchair working this stuff out. You can check NOTAMs. And the other great thing is you can electronically file both VFR and IFR flight plans. So if you're an IFR pilot, this is really great because you can uh, file your flight plan and it ends up in the in the Nav Canada system very, very quickly. If you're flying in the U.S., it works exactly the same. So that is a really great thing, which really does um, improve your flight planning efficiency. And that's what I really like about this software is I can create a flight plan that's accurate really quickly and everything sort of, you know, taking into it, taken into account. Now, this software does um, present us with some other features. So we can do a lot of stuff that we couldn't do easily before when, we, when everything was on paper. So one thing that I really like as somebody who travels around in airplanes a lot is I like the airport and especially the FBO information. So if I need to make arrangements for, uh, you know, tie down, hangar, um, any of that kind of stuff. And in, my, in the corporate world, I, I would also be talking about, you know, rental cars, catering, hotels, all of that stuff. You're, the FBOs can help you. Uh, and you can get telephone numbers, email addresses, all of that stuff. So that's all very, very handy from sort of a, a flight administration point of view. Um, you can get airport information. So if you, you know, you need to talk to the airport operator for whatever reason, you can do that. Often airports now have a website that you can look up a lot of the information. So this is just a, a really convenient way to connect to all of that. If you're an IFR pilot, you can get the instrument approach procedures. Um, Nav Canada doesn't even sell the paper approach charts anymore. So most people now are, are forced to uh, access them via a tablet or you end up going on a you know, going on a website and, and printing the charts off, which, you know, can have um, an inconvenience. The other thing we get are we can get digital en route charts. So en route charts for VFR pilots would include the, the VNCs, visual navigation charts, and the VTAs. Um, and in the IFR world, the low and high en route charts, we can get these um, as, uh, as digital versions, meaning they show up on the, uh, on the tablet. And last but not least, um, most of the flight planning software will allow you to quickly do a weight and balance, you know, and um, arguably there's not much, there's not much more tedious a calculation you can do than a weight and balance calculation. You know, it's a lot, if you're doing it manually, there's a lot of, you know, adding, subtracting, <laughs> multiplying, dividing. Um, it's tedious. And most of these will have an integrated uh, weight and balance calculator. So you can you can figure this stuff out very, very quickly. And by the way, that weight and balance calculation is legal on a on a flight test. You're allowed to use software to do weight and balance. So doesn't mean you shouldn't know how to do it. But, you know, there is a there is a different way of of doing this kind of stuff. As far as in flight weather systems, um, there, we can include things like, um, you know, in a, in a fancy airplane, you may have a panel mounted display. So most new airplanes now come with glass cockpits. So you're getting a, you know, you're getting a screen as opposed to round dials. And most of them have the option of displaying um, of weather in flight. And we'll talk about how you get that in a, in a, um, in a second. The, uh, the other way that you can get in-flight weather systems uh, could be on a portable GPS receiver. So even though a lot of people are flying around with tablets, there is uh, there, you can still find available portable standalone GPS receivers. So this is a purpose-built GPS unit that also includes in-flight weather if you have the right in inputs. And yet a third way of doing it is to have a weather receiver 
that is Bluetooth enabled connected to your tablet. So there are multiple ways that we can get weather in the cockpit. And this is a great safety feature. Uh, a lot of people, once they have it, never want to do without it, especially if you're doing some reasonably serious cross-country flying. You know, and, and when I say serious cross-country flying, I would, I would say that it really relates to your level of experience and your, and your comfort level. So somebody who's new, you know, a couple hundred miles is a big trip. Somebody who has more experience, maybe you literally are flying across the country. But having these systems is, is a fantastic uh, way to um, obtain weather while you're in flight, which, you know, 20 years ago was just a, an amazing thing. Um, in Canada, the best way right now to get uh, in-flight weather is through Sirius XM, which does require a subscription. And uh, this is, uh, well, let's talk about ADS-B first. ADS-B in weather only works in the USA. Yes, you can get it in, in certain parts of Southern Canada, but um, really not reliable. Uh, and this is not an ADS-B seminar, but what I will tell you is that in the United States, as part of their um, ADS-B setup, you also can get ADS-B in, which includes uh, traffic and weather information. In Canada, we have a different ADS-B system that's, uh, that's coming into play, which won't include that. Now, uh, I do know that there is, a, there is a movement, just not to leave anybody out, uh, there's a movement with uh, some private individuals that are, are are essentially making their their own ADSB in network that is supposed to work in Canada. However, uh, it's it's not all there yet, and it's not official yet, and I don't know what the coverage will eventually be. So right now, it's Sirius XM, and you've got to get a get a subscription. The other thing I like about Sirius XM is it does offer in-flight satellite radio, which is um, on a really long trip is a wonderful thing. So a lot of people say, ask the question, okay, which type of weather information system is the best? And, you know, the, the short answer that I, I always give is the one you have is the best. They all work. Um, you know, some may have maybe a little finick, more finicky than others, but any system is better than nothing. And they all have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so if we look at panel mount systems, the advantages are that, you know, these tend to be, you know, they're fairly powerful. They've got multiple features and uh, you, can, you can get lost in the number of menus, uh, you know, that that can be displayed and they can uh, display a lot of information. So uh, for example, a Garmin G1000 system, you know, big screens or, or a, Jar a Garmin uh, 3000 system with big screens, you've got a lot of menus. There's, a, there's multiple features there and you can get all kinds of information in flight, which is great. Um, the other advantage with panel mount systems is, you know, you have a moving map. The weather can be displayed um, on your moving map. It may also include onboard weather radar if you're in a, you know, really fancy airplane. Lightning detection equipment such as a storm scope uh, can be displayed all in one place. So uh, these are great in that they're built in and you don't need to find a place for it. You don't need any kind of a mount. It's all there. You just have to learn how to use it. The disadvantage for these panel mount systems, of course, is that all this integration does come at a cost. And, and you know, not the least of which is you're going to end up purchasing a newer airplane. And, and you know, the price of new airplanes, um, it's one of those things you can't justify. You just rationalize it. Um, and also panel mount avionics must be professionally maintained. So they're going to be soft where updates and uh, different maintenance that's going to have to be performed on it because it's part of the airplane. Um, 
And a lot of this stuff may not be possible for you to put in a, uh, a legacy airplane. So you may not be able to get some of this stuff uh, in an airplane that wasn't delivered with it. Uh, although you can get very good panel mount systems as part of an avionics uh, upgrade. But again, it comes at a cost. None of it is, uh, none of it should ever be described as inexpensive. Portable GPS units, um, you know, and the, and the, Yep, the, this one in the picture here is an iFly GPS, which is one of them that you can uh, you can purchase. There are units produced by Garmin. The Garmin Era series is very popular; works very well. Uh, these are, of course, less expensive than panel mounts. Uh, again, depending on your budget, we may not describe them as inexpensive, um, but you know, for a couple of thousand dollars, which is not much in airplane money. Uh, you can get a lot of features, including a, a GPS. Um, what we what what's great about these portable GPS units is they do tend to be user friendly. You know, most of them now are are touch screen, and so it's like using your uh, your iPhone. Uh, and what is great about them is because you're not trying to do everything on your portable GPS unit. They're fairly robust, meaning they don't tend to break down. They don't tend to freeze up. They generally work pretty well. Um, probably fewer portable GPS units are sold nowadays now that people have, you know, tablets and that kind of thing. Uh, they used to be, you know, very popular. And, you know, sales of these things are going down because the argument is I have this whole other device and all it does is... GPS stuff and display weather. Uh, so that, you know, that that is a consideration. Um, so the disadvantage, main disadvantage of a portable GPS unit is it is more expensive in, than a lot of tablets. Um, and the argument, as I've already said, is that basically it's, you know, it does one thing, one trick pony, not as versatile. You know, you can't, you know, you can't watch uh, net, Netflix or something in your hotel room. Um, so not as popular as before, but useful. And I think the I think the big advantage is that um, the the menus are intuitive, and people find them easy to use. And as I said, they're they're fairly robust. They're designed to do one thing, and they do it fairly well. So that's one of the uh, you, know, you know something in favor of one of these uh, portable GPS units. This brings us to tablets. So, you know, tablets have a number of advantage, advantages. Um, they are less expensive than the other two options. You know, they're, they're tens of thousands of dollars less than retrofitting the avionics in your airplane. And if you are uh, in flight training, you don't have the option of uh, asking the flying school to uh, upgrade the avionics. Um, a lot of people already have a tablet. Um, so, you know, that's, this is really not an additional expense if you already have one. You can use the, uh, the tablet for other tasks. So, you know, Netflix in the hotel, not being a, a minor one. You can adapt it to different software. The displays have excellent resolution. Various sizes are available depending on what kind of airplane you're flying. So, the, you know, tablets have been adopted into aviation for a really good reason in that they're, they're, they have a lot of advantages. The one that's in the picture here is shown with a, uh, with, uh, a mount. And you can buy different mounts so that uh, you can sort of have the tablet um, displayed where you want it. And also so it doesn't, you know, fall on the floor and break. Uh, there are different mounts out there. And again, this... this uh, session is not about you know choosing the right mount just know if you look around they're out there and i recommend having some kind of a way to um you know attach it to the uh, inside of the airplane works a lot better as far as a disadvantage goes uh you know a lot of the a lot of users do report that you know the interface may take a little bit of getting used to um 
you know, you've got a Bluetooth connection in many, in many cases. Uh, tablets require charging. So it always seems like, you know, somebody shows up to the, uh, to the airplane and, uh, you know, it's got a 30% battery. Well, that's not going to work too well. Um, you know, one, one advantage of paper charts is that they don't need batteries. They don't, they don't fail. They don't fade out in sunlight, but, um, you want to make sure that if you are going to use it, have a way to charge it. So again, a lot of airplanes now are, are coming equipped with, um, <clears throat> USB charging. It's, it's not that expensive to add it to an airplane if you own it, uh, or you can use the, uh, um, I still call it a cigarette lighter because the, a lot of the vintage airplanes we're flying came with a cigarette lighter. You can plug into that. You know, there are different ways to keep your tablet uh, charged. And, you know, I, I've got a lot of uh, students that simply have uh, one of those external power banks, you know, in the event that the tablet becomes um, low battery. You need a way to keep your uh, tablet secured. I've already talked a little bit about finding a finding a mount, and you know the other minor problem. And the, and again, this is this is something that uh, you need to explore a little bit. Is that not all tablets work with all software or external inputs? So you know, if you get a Stratus, which is one of the one of the popular. Um, uh, external GPSs that has a, a Sirius XM receiver, it doesn't like some tablets. So you're just going to have to uh, uh, work your way through that and just know that um, when you use a tablet, you become more responsible for making sure it all, you know, everything talks to each other. And, uh, you know, you may, you may want to employ um, the, uh, the advice of somebody who has done this before to save yourself the frustration. Okay. So moving on and talking about when we're actually going to do flight planning and we're going to use software to do it, we need to understand that, you know, there's, there's a lot of good reasons for doing this. Um, and the great thing about flight planning with software is it it allows you to perform these calculations really, really quickly and accurately. And if you need to redo them, it doesn't take very long. So you can, you know, once you're once you're very low, you know, fairly well versed with the software, you can log on and create a flight plan and you know, in 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 half a minute, you've got a you've got a flight plan that's got all the calculations done. Uh, you know, something that would have taken you a long time when you were doing this uh, manually. Um, at the end, you'll you'll have a uh, a nice navigation flight log that can be displayed on the uh, on your screen. Or a lot of people like to print it, and the reason they like to print it is, uh, well, you need paper to write on if you're flying IFR anyway. But also, if uh, if the screen goes dark, at least you've got something. So you know you don't have to print it, but you can, and uh, and generally the uh, the software will allow you to do that. Uh, it just makes flight planning really really simple. It makes it convenient, and and more important, it's it's fairly accurate. So some other things that we all we like about flight planning with software is that. Um, the uh, the software uh, programmers are normally going to integrate the aircraft performance with the wind and you know and any other uh, uh, weather information that's that's required. And this is something that you would have had to have done, you know, as the as the pilot, you know, using the the pilot operating handbook and the winds aloft and temperature forecasts and all of that stuff. So a lot of the tedious work is eliminated, uh, which contributes to safety. And uh, you know, I think that um, especially when you're planning long trips, this is really a great way to go. And at the end of it all, you can file your flight plan electronically. So you create the flight plan. You know, the software knows how long it's going to take you to to uh, get to your destination. You can file it electronically, and it's all done very seamlessly. And that's you know that's pretty wonderful.
So another great thing about using uh, any of these software programs is that there's a variety of weather available. So again, depending on the program that you use, um, you're going to see information that you're familiar with. You know, TAFs, METARs, they're pretty much the same. You may see stuff that's presented a little bit different, differently. Um, you know, the software developers are trying to make it a little more user-friendly and intuitive. Uh, in some cases, what this means is they take uh, information and, and use sort of a U.S. style of, of presenting the information. And in, in particular, uh, I'm thinking about the GFAs that we're familiar with here in, uh, in Canada. So the information that is the same, uh, METARs, TAFs, those are international. SIGMETs, AIRMETs, again, those are, are generally presented in the form of uh, text. And, you know, they, they're going to come out and look, look essentially the same. You're not really going to have a problem um, understanding them. I know, for example, that uh, on uh, flightplan.com, if you look at a METAR, when the weather is particularly bad, so you have a really low ceiling, one thing they do is they highlight it in red. So that makes it readily identifiable that, hey, you really need to look at this. It's a 400-foot it's a ceiling, not a 4,000-foot ceiling. So that's helpful. But this kind of stuff is going to look you know, it look essentially the same. What is a little harder to find sometimes and, you know, might be missing, um, you're likely not going to find GFAs, so graphic area forecasts. Uh, flying in Canada, they use a different system in the United States. Um, you may not find uh, FDs if you want them, which are the upper wind and temperature forecasts. Uh, you don't actually need them in many cases because the software grabs that information and, and programs it anyway. But if you wanted to know, for example, what the upper wind and temperature forecast was, um, you're probably not going to find it on ForeFlight or um, a Flight Plan Go. Another thing that's missing are a lot of the weather charts that are produced by Environment Canada. So the surface analysis, upper air analysis, significant weather progs, et cetera, they may not be available. Um, oops. So you're going to need to end up going to the, uh, to the Nav Canada website. So what we have here is um, a, uh, a representation of, of, the, uh, of the graphic area forecast. And just take you through it it'll this video will just play and this is the uh the awws website which is being uh decommissioned at some point you can see there are different products that are available and if we go weather and no tams on the nav canada website options for pre-flight briefings and flight plans. And then we could select either the collaborative flight planning services, which is this one here. If you have a username and a password, you can put it in there. However, you can get weather um, without um, having a password, continue as a guest. You put all that information in and if you go to weather and no tams, you simply type in this. In this case, we've typed in CYYJ. And then you can select which information you want. So it, it's displayed a little differently than the tried and true AWWS uh, website. And AWWS is, uh, we are told, is reaching the end of its useful life. And you can see here that you can choose a lot of this stuff from the collaborative um, site.
And in this case, we're looking at um, some NOTAMs. Now, the uh, important thing about the NOTAMs is that they are no longer available on the AWWS site. So if you're wondering where they went, this is where they went. They went to the collaborative um, site. And we can also see here, we've got a graphic area forecast. This one's for British Columbia. And uh, again, presented in a slightly different way. You can select any of the three uh, panes that you want. And there's the icing, turbulence, and freezing level uh, chart. And remember, we picked all of this stuff on the left-hand side. So this is going to be the, the site that we're all going to come to love going forward. And then again, different, um, different information, the satellite photograph there. And it does present it in a rather, uh, a rather elegant way going forward. So this was a, a number of days back, um, significant weather progs, et cetera. So all of those, all of those charts that, uh, that you might want, the great thing about this site is you can sort of pick it all and, uh, and you can kind of get it all at once and you just have to scroll through it. So it's a little more elegant than the, uh, than the uh, AWWS site. Although a lot of us, me included, are still, um, you know, sentimentally attached to it. So going forward, talking about using software, you know, is it a deal breaker that you can't necessarily get all that stuff? In most cases, it isn't, okay? In most cases, you're going to get um, equivalent or near equivalent information provided on these uh, flight planning websites. Um, these are going to work well in Southern Canada and in the, in the, in the USA, especially. So, uh, you can see here where we've got, um, an example from, uh, for flight, you know, where this thing is all nicely presented to you. This is Hamilton, but it's all, it's all been decoded for you. Um, so, you know, that's kind of handy, especially if you're not necessarily, uh, a hundred percent up on how to read a weather forecast or report. So that's kind of helpful. So if you really need the missing information, you really feel like you need, just go to the uh, go to the Nav Canada website. You, nothing is nothing is saying you can't use it. You can still use your your chosen app or website to flight plan. So if you like for flight, use that. If you like flight plan go, use that. Um, and that's going to give you the TAFs and METARs and NOTAMs, which are the things we're used to carrying around. Uh, we can print them out or, or display them. And the great thing about the, uh, the flight planning websites is that even when you cross the border, it's seamless. And that's not something you generally are going to get on, uh, on the NAV Canada website, which is, you know, sort of restricted to, uh, to Canada only. And uh, I don't know how many of you out there are flying across the border. I guess for a couple of years, nobody was doing it very much. But we are uh, uh, getting back to normal, I guess. And, and hopefully some of you will, will be able to take a trip across the border. And this is, again, a very convenient way to, uh, to do that. Um, so what do we got here? So this, uh, again, is uh, just displaying, you know, the uh, forecasts and observations. And this is, uh, uh, I think, just to illustrate with uh, NOTAMs how you type CYYJ, and this is on the AWWS website. Um, and it essentially tells you you have to go to the other website. So, um that could be frustrating, especially if you didn't know about the other website. So uh, you're going to move over to the um, collaborative flight planning website. 
And just as we as we showed before, um, you're going to go over to here and select that. You don't have to enter a uh, a password, but again, CYYJ, Victoria, you pick your no temps, and they'll display. And there they are. So that's where the no temps live now. I don't know whether that was a uh, a technical issue or if it was just a way for Nav Canada to nudge us over to using the uh, collaborative flight planning website. It displays fairly. Uh, it's a nice display, I think, and it seems to it seems to be um, perhaps uh, better laid out than what we had previously. So again, something that not everybody knows because this wasn't necessarily around when you were being trained on this stuff. Okay, back to flight planning software. So. Um, Again, with the right inputs, the software will allow you to to overlay your weather on your navigation chart. So we've got you know we've got a, a reasonably uh, extreme example here between Ottawa and, uh, and and Saint Jean. I think this was the day I was trying to fly into the Copa Convention, and you can see that you know all of the green is rain, and where it's a little more intense, it's uh, yellow or red, and uh, there's the track line. So that makes it pretty easy to figure out where the ugly weather that I don't want to be in is located. Um, this works really well when you have areas of, of precipitation, thunderstorms, icing conditions. So it just really does make it easier and therefore safer for you to, uh, you to fly around and, and have an idea where the, where the ugly stuff is. And, you know, in, in years gone by, we would have had to fly around with this sort of in our, uh, and kind of keep the picture in our head. And depending on how much experience you had and how good you are at that sort of thing, it could go well or maybe not so well for you. So in the safety business of aviation, we call this situational awareness. Um, and that simply means you're aware of what's going on around you. You know, and that's, you know, we like to use fancy terms like that, but your situational awareness is going to be much improved if you can simply overlay the weather uh, on top of the track that you're, you're uh, trying to fly. You know, and of course you can do this if you have um, software built into the airplane or you're using a, uh, a dedicated GPS, you can do that quite easily if you have the right inputs. Um but the nice thing is we're going to get near near real time data displayed, um, so it, you know it's important that you uh, th that you know that. And again, here's here's um, an image from uh, from ForeFlight, and there's our navigation chart. So this is an actual navigation chart, and it's got the weather uh, because we've selected that displayed um, on top of the weather. Uh, so this was a day I was attempting to fly a Diamond DA-40 from my home base in St. Catharines up to St. Jean. And uh, I ended up with a six-hour car ride. This is the same kind of thing in, uh, in flightplan.com, you know, slightly different. You can argue about which one you like better. Um, but uh, you get the idea that this is ugly and maybe wherever this is, you don't want to be going there. Okay, so um, we're about to talk about flight planning. And Sharon, I think this was the time when we, we discussed that we might do the take a break. Yes, I think that's a good idea. And then maybe we'll answer a, a few of the questions that have been um, passed along in the chat. Uh, most of it is, uh, most of what I'm seeing in the chat right now is a bit of comparison between Garmin and ForeFlight. Uh, but there are some good questions that we could get to. How about we take a, uh, a 10 minute break and we'll round it up to, so it's 6.58 right now. Let's cut back for 7, 10 p.m. Eastern time. 
Uh, so I'll let everyone do the math. And I'll play a, uh, a video from Sirius XM in a few short minutes as well. Okay. Okay. Yep. See you all soon.
I'm Jeff Owen. I have about 1,300 hours. I have uh, ratings single engine land, single engine C, multi engine land, tailwheel endorsement. I'm halfway through my instrument ratings, so my instructor is, uh, is walking me through icing, really important obviously, winds aloft, um, some of the additional features. In fact, just a week ago we paged through every button on the XM Weather, Sirius XM Weather uh, page just to find out what's out there. I was actually startled at how much I was missing. Well, I like that uh, it's accessible on the ground. It's great for flight planning, especially in a slower airplane, um, even in the air cam. Uh, just being able to access and plan on the ground before you take off is a big plus for me. Hey folks, if you're just joining, um, I'm going to put in the chat the, the, the details to include in your logbook for the recurrent training. And uh, we do have uh, Eric Haas with us, for, uh, who uh, is a pilot out in the U.S. and um, I believe an avid YouTuber as well. So we'll learn more about uh, his use of, of Zolio uh, after we, we continue presentations with Conrad here. And this is a, a, a good time to ask if uh, you could put any questions that you may have in the chat.
All right, Conrad, are we ready to get back to it? We are ready to get back to it. And uh, talk a little bit about actual uh, actual flight planning. Um, so as we've already alluded to, um, using uh, flight planning software or app, it allows you to do this stuff really easily. Um, you can play around with it a little bit and figure out just how easy it is, but you don't have to be even particularly computer savvy. And that's what I like about it is that with, you know, some fairly basic computer skills, if you can run a smartphone, you can file, you know, you can create a flight plan. Um, it's accurate. So, you know, it's pretty much, pretty much automatic the way you go through it. So that's, that's good. And you can create a flight plan and file it very quickly. So these are all these are all great things about about fl flight planning with uh, with software. Um, also, depending again on the on the program that you use, um, aircraft performance data probably going to be integrated. And I know that I know that ForeFlight has a couple of different tiers, you know, where there's uh, you know basic performance information. And then there is the the sort of the enhanced performance information you pay a little more for. Uh, flight plan doesn't have the tiers; they just seem to give it to you. Um, so, true airspeed, fuel consumption, all this stuff is going to be fed into the uh, into the calculation. It's going to grab the wind and temperature information and just bake it into the calculation, which is which is all which is all pretty great. Um, of interest to IFR pilots, and you know, maybe if you don't have an instrument rating, you want to think about getting one. Um, the mandatory uh, routes or preferred routes in the U.S. Uh, may be selected, so it's um, it's a lot easier to do that because this is a tedious part of IFR planning. If you've got to go into the Canada Flight Supplement and you know, sort of piece together what the mandatory routing may be. Um, for IFR flight planning. Hey, hey, Conrad, sorry to jump in here. Yep. Uh, I'm not seeing your slides on, on my end. Could you try resharing them? I will try resharing them. Thank you. Stand by. Let's do this. I didn't unshare them, but... Perhaps when we did that, how's that? I'm not seeing it yet. That's interesting. It says your screen share is on. Let me turn it off. Let's try it again. Okay. So I'm turning it on. Oh, how's there that? we go. We're there seeing go. it. Okay. Looking good. Um, do we need to back up? Uh, maybe just, uh, 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 yes, I, th I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> okay. We're going to, we're going to back up. Um, so I'm going to say this again, but this is more for the recording that's going to come later. And, uh, hopefully now everybody can see what is, uh, what is on here. So, uh, advantages of using uh, a flight planning software. Um, we can create a flight plan easily. It's not tedious. We can do it accurately because it, you know, software takes care of a lot of it. It's very automatic and it's really quick. You know, you don't need to be a, a computer genius in order to, uh, to use this, this stuff. So that's really great. Another thing that's good is, uh, is that our aircraft performance data may be integrated and depending on what software you use, uh, you know, for example, ForeFlight has a couple of different tiers of uh, flight planning software. Um, you can you can get the one that you know suits your particular uh, flying needs. But true airspeed, fuel consumption, all of that's going to be integrated into the calculation, and the wind and temperature information is going to be in there as well. So that really does take care a lot of, of a lot of it. When it comes to IFR flight planning. 
uh, the mandatory or preferred routes uh, are going to be required and you can select them. Um, something that's great about uh, all of this uh, software is that we can kind of get an idea by looking at the at the recent history about which routes have been assigned and approved by by ETC um, and then very quickly load the desired route which may have a bunch of waypoints and maybe an arrival all of this stuff and the software will will calculate the time and fuel burn uh, based on the route that we have selected so again that makes it very very easy um, so that's that's great um, also with IFR flight planning we have to consider our alternate airport so this is a lot easier the software may in fact suggest alternate airports based on you know distance from our uh, from our uh, destination and it will apply the time and fuel burn to the alternate so this takes out a lot of the a lot of the grunt work of creating an IFR uh, flight plan and you know makes it makes it safer um, most flight planning software will will automatically crank out an I ICAO flight plan form. Now, this is really great if you're taking a uh, taking a check ride because um, theoretically we still require these things. I don't know anybody that's actually used one for many many years, but you know you can create one rather quickly, and all the fields will be filled in, and uh, you know all of the uh, the rather uh, uh, you know sort of uh, esoteric codes are going to be put into uh, into the flight plan. Um, we used to fill these things out and, and fax them to uh, the flight service station. Nobody does that anymore. But if you need one, you you have one. And there are some uh, some uh, charter companies or, or uh, commercial companies that still require you to crank out a, a Nav Canada flight plan form. You can do it, you know, do it fairly easily. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, largely academic. The navigation log, as we've already alluded to, will be automatically generated. Again, you can print it. You can display it on the tablet. But you've got all of the, uh, the information there. It's also going to show you some stuff that you probably wouldn't have had if you'd done this manually, such as headwind or tailwind information at various altitudes. So you might decide to change your altitude. Um, True airspeed, fuel burn, time en route at various altitudes. So that's uh, that's kind of interesting that it gives you all of that information and and maybe you know you can decide whether uh, if you have to go up, what kind of a penalty you might pay or what kind of advantage you might get. So it allows you to be a little bit strategic with your uh, altitude. And again, that's something that you probably couldn't do before because if you're doing it manually, you're not going to calculate. Uh, the um, the trip at you know three or four or five different altitudes, but software can do it very very quickly, so that's great. All right, so what's the downside? What's the catch? And the catch is that um, you have to make sure that the correct aircraft performance data is loaded. So uh, you know little things that can catch you like. Perhaps in the uh, software, they assume 75% power, but you normally cruise at 65% power. So there are ways that you can, you can change this. You've got to load the aircraft-specific information, such as registration, the avionics equipment, you know, the things that are required on a flight plan, the color. All of that stuff has to be loaded into the aircraft uh, profile. And I think a lot of people that are new to this software would probably tell you, this might be the trickiest part, uh, but the software is not going to work properly uh, without it. So, you know, the first time that you use it, just understand that uh, there may be a little bit of uh, administrative work that you need to do. Uh, I have found that um, for flight and flight plan go, um, the uh, technical support actually is quite good. If you need help, they'll help you. Okay, filing a flight plan. So, you, so we have this wonderful thing where we can file a flight plan electronically. So there's no more waiting on, you know, in the in the queue at uh, Nav Canada um, for Nav Canada Flight Information Center. 
We can file domestic and cross-border flight plans. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we can update it as required prior to the departure time. So all of this is 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 pretty wonderful. Um, and you know, it will. Uh, this is just a screenshot from uh, flightplan.com. You know, beginning to fill everything in and creating a flight plan. Again, uh, an example from flightplan.com where we simply hit the file button and it will it will file this flight plan, the one that has been um, has been created. Most of these programs have a couple of different ways you can do it. So here's another one. Again, this happens to be from flightplan.com, but we we simply click the click the file button and it will uh, it will uh, allow you to file the flight plan. A couple of things you need to be careful of. Um, one is you want to make sure your flight plan doesn't auto activate before you depart. And again, that depends on on where you are. And this is really important um, at airports with no flight service station or, or tower. And you need to know how to amend that flight plan via telephone when required. Um, what goes with that is uh, is, is again, it requires a little bit of knowledge. Essentially, if it's a VFR flight plan, you can amend it. Um, if it, you know, if it has already auto activated, you can amend it by calling the flight service station, either when you get airborne, if it's close to the departure time, or if you're really off, you may want to call them on the phone before you leave. For IFR flight plans, uh, every Air Traffic Control Center in Canada has a toll-free number that uh, you should store in your phone, and uh, you can actually call the area control center. So you can call the uh, the radar controller and say, "Hey, I was supposed to be uh, lifted off ten minutes ago. I need you to push my flight plan back." And that's important when the flight plan has already been filed and perhaps the uh, the IFR clearance has already been generated, but. Uh, that's something that works a little bit differently. So, you know, at the end of the day, you might have to amend it with a phone call. That's okay. So how about once we're in flight? You know, we create this flight plan. Um, you're going to load your waypoints into your, uh, into your GPS manually. However, one of the new things we have is uh, it works with a lot of the Garmin systems, Garmin Connect will allow you to load your flight plans from your tablet electronically right into your panel mounted avionics. So this is this is kind of, you know, kind of space age stuff and uh, you know Garmin is uh, is is sort of a leader in this and uh, it's something that if you have a, you know, if you have the right system and you have an airplane that uh, has updated avionics, it really does make it kind of painless. Um, having said that, the new avionics is fairly easy to load the flight plan manually if you have to do that. It's not really that big a chore. But we're moving towards, you know, making everything as seamless as possible. Again, depending on the inputs you have, um, on your tablet, you're going to have a moving map. So you're going to show, a, you know, a little airplane with your track line and the aircraft position uh, relative to the track line. So in order to make that work, you need a, a GPS input to your tablet. Um, and many tablets have a built-in GPS. Uh, a lot of pilots report that, you know, these things work sometimes, but not always, because really the GPS in your tablet's not designed to work in an airplane. Uh, so uh, many people find that an external GPS source is, is either required because their tablet doesn't work, or, uh, or it's just better because it's designed to do that. So when I talk about these external um, GPS sources, uh, you know, they get fairly fancy with inputs from Sirius XM or ADSB. You don't have to have that. There are various inexpensive ones that are available. And I, I've used, uh, I think, all of them that are shown on the screen here. Uh, the, you know, the Dual and the, uh, the Garmin. Uh, the Garmin Glow, and not that expensive, um, and the Bad Elf. And these are all designed basically to sit up on top of the glare shield and send a signal to your tablet and provide you with that external uh, GPS source. Um, 
the basic ones I think are, you know, they're like 100 and, 130, $150. Don't quote me, uh, but not, not that expensive in airplane money uh, for what you get. And you can go, you know, you can go crazy with all kinds of other inputs, but if you just want something that will, you know, make your tablet work really well, one of these is a, is a, is a great choice. Um, yeah, so we've already talked about that. These will connect via Bluetooth to your, uh, to your tablet and they seem to work fairly well. All of them that I've ever used, they work well. Um, as far as choosing one, you know, the more you pay, the more you get. Um, some of the units like the Garmin Glow use, use both the American GPS and the Russian uh, GLONASS uh, satellites. And uh, some will generate attitude and heading information. So in other words, if you have your a total electrics failure, you get kind of an instrument panel that you can use. The Stratus will do that, for example. And, you know, we can use that as a, as a backup. So again, you know, an improvement on, uh, on safety. So, you, you know, you look at what's out there uh, and, and not to, you know, to trumpet anybody in particular, but uh, there are, um, there is equipment available uh, for you. And to make this really, really work, you may want to get something like this. So other features that you may get, depending on, again, on, you know, how much you've invested. You may get airspace warnings. You'll certainly get that if you have uh, panel-mounted equipment or, uh, or dedicated GPS. Uh, sometimes you can get NOTAMs. Uh, you're going to get track guidance and steering information. And, and again, um, depending on how much you, you've paid or how integrated the avionics are, you get time and, in many cases, fuel to the destination. So you'll have an idea in pretty much real time what the uh, how much fuel you'll have when you arrive and whether or not you're comfortable with that. If you're an IFR pilot, and again, if you're not, maybe you should think about it, your aircraft position is going to be displayed on um, the en route charts, but also on the approach charts. And that will improve that, that critical situational awareness especially when you're you know you're flying an instrument approach in actual imc conditions and that's going to increase safety because it, you know if you're more aware of what's going on and you can you can see where the airplane is it just makes everything easier to visualize and you're not having to construct this this moving map in your head which takes a long time to get uh, to get good at it weather information in flight so we need a weather in source. We've already talked about that. We've already talked about the fact that in Canada, you're probably going to be getting this from Sirius XM uh, somehow, you know, uh, into your tablet or into your uh, into your avionics uh, or into your portable GPS. You're going to get um, you're going to be able to overlay hazardous weather information in flight as we've already talked about. So you might have had a look at the uh, hazardous weather information on your tablet on the ground, but in flight, if you have the, the correct inputs, you're going to be able to see that. You're going to be able to get METARs and TAFs and other weather um, products. And this is really great for uh, what I call strategic weather avoidance. So strategic weather avoidance is not the same as tactical weather avoidance. In other words, we're gonna look at the big picture and if there's ugly weather shown there, we're gonna decide probably not to go there. Uh, you're not gonna use this uh, type of equipment to penetrate weather. So you really have to be careful when you're using this, uh, this type of a download because satellite weather was never intended to be used to allow you to to penetrate or or fly around weather. It doesn't replace onboard weather radar. And as pilots, you have to understand that the picture you're looking at uh, could be quite old, and that's a problem because there's a there's a delay. And uh, you know even the uh, even the guy that sort of invented satellite download weather uh, goes to great pains to educate pilots that this picture you're looking at. Um, doesn't necessarily reflect the current 
uh, the current weather. But it does give you an idea that something's there. And, uh, you know, you need to avoid it by other means, which is either going to be weather radar or the Mark I eyeball of not flying towards clouds that look big and dark and have lightning coming out of them. So the big problem is that it's really difficult to determine how old that weather picture is. The age information that's shown on the screen is the age of the download, not the age of the image. So the image may be, you know, you might, it might say that this information was downloaded five minutes ago. It doesn't mean that that picture was created five minutes ago. It means it was downloaded five minutes ago. So you may be looking at a picture that's really old, but you really wouldn't have any way of knowing. And that's, you know, that is an issue if you're trying to penetrate weather. So I have to caution you that as great as this is, it doesn't replace live weather radar, which is really the only tool we have for penetrating weather. And that's a whole nother discussion. That's way beyond what we're talking about tonight. But it is, it is way better than nothing. And it's way better to have an idea that, hey, there might be something out there. So at least you are aware and you can make, um, you can make good pilot decisions based on that. So a couple of other things to to think about, you know, is so I get asked the question all the time. So, you know, people say, so this radar picture that I've got is useless. No, it's not. OK, you want to use it for strategically avoiding weather. You got a heads up. You're going to look for bad weather. So it's, if you know that bad weather is out there, you're going to be able to to look for it. And, you know, you can augment that with um, with air traffic control, if you're talking to air traffic control, or the flight information center has, you know, fairly good weather data, uh, or other airborne equipment such as uh, airborne weather radar. So this shows a, a NEXRAD picture. NEXRAD is, just stands for Next Generation Radar, and it's um, NEXRAD weather data is a little better than raw weather radar data because you know it's sort of enhanced. Somebody's done the done the coloring for you, and you don't have it. Doesn't require as much uh, interpretation, and that's what we like about Nexrad. Um, METAR and TAF information, you know, you're going to get that in close to real time. Again, it depends on you know uh, the uh, how the download comes in. But, you know, you can expect to get METARs every hour. My experience has been most of the time I get them about when I would expect, uh, maybe a minute or two later than I would if I was, you know, actually online. And again, same thing with, with TAFs. So that, that can allow me to make educated decisions. Uh, you know, do I continue? Do I turn around? Do I divert? You know, those are all actual pilot decisions. And I've got, I've got good data. And you can see here that... Um, the information can be presented in a number of different ways. You know, this uh, weather legend with the flags, this is something that uh, Garmin uses. Um, but a lot of times you may just want to read the METAR or read the TAF and, and make your decision as you would if you were sitting in front of your uh, computer or, or at home or, uh, or if you got the information from a flight service station. So this allows us to uh, make these decisions a little better, travel with a little more confidence, and I think uh, improve safety. So this is the end of the formal part. Um, you know, just wanting to say that flight planning software and weather tools uh, are not only make things safer, but I think it makes it a lot more fun. That's the that's the feedback I get from uh, from people that you know maybe just learned to fly and now they've explored using uh, flight planning software and maybe have a few uh, cockpit tools that they've uh, they've acquired. They just say it's a lot more fun. And I feel a lot more confident. And, uh, you know, you have to assess your own budget and your own needs. Um, you know, you, you probably don't need a whole lot if all you ever do is fly 30 miles, you know, to uh, to your favorite hamburger spot and you turn around and come back. I would like to encourage you to do a little more than that. And I think that's that's a, a way to get a little bit more of this pilot's license that you invested in. 
And I think that having this kind of equipment improves your confidence, improves safety. And, you know, a lot of people say, I don't know how I ever get along without, you know, my, uh, my satellite weather or, you know, how did we ever do this when we were drawing lines on maps? And it's just a, another way of, uh, of uh, improving the overall enjoyment out of, uh, from aviation. So that's the end. And I guess now we're going to take some questions. Sharon, are you there? There we go. I just turned uh, your screen share off and, and put you back on the screen. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive overview of uh, many different flight planning software options out there. Lots of debates and information sharing in the uh, in the chat. There's a polite clapping. There's there's ladies and gentlemen in the room. So that's that's nice to see. That's nice to see. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, going back to the to the tools, there's there was a question very early on about the difference between Sirius XM radar and in-app um, radar, so for flight radar. Uh, could you expand on on the difference there? Um, the um, so on. Uh, on Sirius XM, if we're if we're looking at the if we're if we're doing flight planning and we're on the ground, it's going to generate you know uh, normally it's going to be a Nexrad picture. So you know Nexrad is going to is going to be the ultimate source, and all Sirius XM does is it takes that Nexrad picture and it allows us to access it in flight. So in theory, it's the same thing. Uh, the difference is going to be uh, how long it takes to download. And, you know, there may be, there may, may be a difference there. So, you know, probably on the ground, the, uh, the picture may be a little bit newer. Um, we don't have one of the, one of the disadvantages of a satellite download when you're, when you're flying is you don't know how old the picture is. So I can't say with absolute certainty, if we put one against the other, that they're going to be identical. They probably aren't, but they're certainly better than having nothing. You know, and pilots love to debate this kind of thing. Certain pilots like to debate it more than others. But, uh, you know, essentially, uh, Nexrad is is going to be the uh, the ultimate source. So it's really how you get it. Okay. I mean, you're right. Everybody pr has preferences with their tools, right? So yep. that, that's, that's a good answer. Um, this, there was a question on the rules around having a backup to an iPad in case it, it dies, of course. Uh, I, I believe there was an answer in the chat, but perhaps you could expand on on the, uh, the and if there's any CARS requirements for that. Uh, for private operators, there aren't. For commercial operators, uh, you know, they, we have, uh, depending on, on what level of commercial operator, there are, for example, there are operations that require three iPads, you know, so you have one for each of the pilots and then a third one in a, you know, accessible. Um, but for, for private operators, um, you know, it's whatever, whatever you feel you're safe doing. Um, when I go on long trips, generally we have more than one iPad or, you know, just because that, that kind of makes sense. But, um, you know, the other thing is that uh, if you're navigating, and your iPad dies, um, it might be handy to have a, you know, maybe even an old chart or something around, depending on how far you're going. Uh, so, th you know, there is that. You have to plan for that eventuality. And I guess it depends what your risk tolerance is. It also depends on how bad the weather is. It also depends on, you know, on, on where you're going, you know. So there's, there, these are pilot decisions like many others. Um, but you know, I would recommend at least have a way to charge it. And, and one of the, one of the, um, common complaints we get with tablets is in the summertime, depending on where you put them, they overheat and they, and they kind of shut down. This is a problem. And I think there are as many solutions to that problem 
as as we can come up with. So there are different devices that uh, that uh, cool the iPad or the or the tablet. I found that when it does that, I just take it out of the sun for a while and it comes back. Um, you know, so definitely have a backup. Um, does that mean you have to go out and buy two tablets? I guess that depends on your risk tolerance. There you go, a plethora of options. Uh, a cooling pad perhaps for your tablet if, you, uh, if you're if you using that. Uh, I am seeing plenty of people uh, in the chat with many uh, positive comments on the presentation. That's great. Stick around. We do have uh, this, this Q&A here. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat. And we do have a short presentation coming up from our friends at Zolio. Um, so uh, I'm going to continue asking a few more questions. Uh, what else was there? Now, going over to CFPS uh, and uh, the beloved AWWS, I know that there was plenty of questions on whether or not Nav Canada will have a um, uh, an app or a uh, more of a responsive app, I suppose. So the ability to use CFPS on your phone and also your tablet in the future. I know you, you can't really answer that yourself, but uh, perhaps you have some indication there. I haven't heard uh, of anything coming from, from Nav Canada, um, whether they, you know, they're going to do that. I kind of hope they do. And, you know, maybe we can, we can, uh, push the software engineers there to do a little more um, because the world is changing. I mean, you know, we, we are, uh, we have changed a lot, especially in the last, you know, 10 years ago in a flying school, nobody knew about any of this stuff. And um, you know, it's been around for longer than that, but um, you know, we, we are moving from, from a, uh, a system that was really dependent on, you know, making a phone call to the flight information center. And I mean, you know, there might be some, some old guys here who remember when, you know, you'd call the Toronto flight service station back then, it wasn't even the FIC and you'd wait on hold for an hour to, you know, just to check the weather and get a flight plan. We've moved past that. So I'm, you know, I, I am hopeful that the, uh, the, the uh, CFPS will maybe, integrate with this stuff a little bit better and that maybe there will be some kind of app, but I haven't heard that there's going to be, um, you know, what we've, what we've mostly heard is that our, you know, our, our tried and true AWWS is going to sunset at some point. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's probably going to cause a ripple because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of flight instructors and a lot of people that have been in the flight training system, are really comfortable with it. You know, it's, it's old, but it kind of works and it's not, it's sort of intuitive. Uh, but I think the new system actually works fairly well in that it's fairly streamlined. I don't know what kind of computer sorcery is required to turn that into an app, uh, but you know, everything's an app these days. You can get an app to order pizza. You should be able to get it to get aviation weather. That's right. I mean, it's been two years since I was at NAV, but I recall, uh, some some need for it to be uh, compatible with tablets because no TAM originators needed to use it as well uh, for CFPS. So there's mul multiple users for the application itself. Uh, I think that might help influence the the need or, or create more impetus for the need of a of a tablet friendly uh, software. Well, and maybe they need to hear from us too that this is something that that right. people would use, you know, and, and uh, uh, I think that if you're uh, a programmer at, at Nav Canada, you sort of do that every day and maybe you're not a hundred percent aware of what, of what people want. And I think if it's something that we want, you know, we probably need to say so in, in one voice. And I, you know, I don't think, um, I don't think that creating an app is all that difficult anymore. You know, it's it's uh, it's something that, pe you know, is done thousands of times every day. Right. You can get an app for anything. So 
I won't say that because a computer engineer might come for me, so I won't agree to that necessarily. But uh, yes, I, I, I would say that COPA uh, has had conversations with NAV Canada on yeah. how, uh, how uh, pilots would like to use CFPS as well. And, so- and that's not to throw shade on anybody. It's just that, you know, um, I, I think that um, probably it's incumbent on us to at least say what we want or say, you know, say what would be useful and, and get that discussion um, maybe more on the forefront. And it's good that COPA has been doing that. Very good. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with, uh, if you would like to leave any last thoughts with the group here. Uh, if for those of you who don't know, COPA has a partnership with Hangar, uh, and, and that's largely in part with uh, uh uh, as a result of our relationship with Conrad Hatrin and Paul King. So um, our Discover Aviation program is an outreach initiative where our COPA flights or our chapters offer free discovery or introductory flights to uh, members of the public, to to veterans, to women, to all, all kinds of groups to help uh, bring them into the to aviation fold. So thank you very much for uh, your leadership there, Hanger. Uh, or Conrad, if you'd like to leave any last thoughts, let me know or let us know. Well, um, just that, uh, you know, I I hope that as the world gets closer to normal, that people will venture out a little bit and and maybe try some things that are are different and, and challenging. I just saw a comment there that somebody sort of saying, you know, pre GPS, Flying was a lot more of an adventure and it was, you know, it's really hard to get lost now. Well, I, I get the adventure part, but uh, uh, I think that, you know, the the tools that we have now really make flying safer and more accessible. And, uh, you know, people should take advantage of that. So, you know, I have a saying that, you know, you can have a hundred hours or you can have the same hour a hundred times. And you should try not to be the person that has the same hour a hundred times, you know, maybe, maybe open the map to the other side and maybe go somewhere that's up there or something like that. You know, something a little bit out of your, uh, not way out of your comfort zone, but you know, something that will, will challenge and more to the point inspire you. And I think that's, that's really important because, um, you know, all the time and, and, and money and effort that we put into getting a, a pilot's license, you know, you, uh, you really need to try and and maximize the enjoyment. And that's, that's the other thing is we all need to get out there and have some fun with this. I think that's vital. That's, that's a, a, a wonderful perspective. Thank you. For those of you in the chat, stand by or still in the room, stand by. Uh, thank you, Conrad. Uh, I'd, I'd now like to welcome on our, our friends at Zolio. So we have Eric Haas, who is the SoCal Flying Monkey. So avid YouTuber, uh, lots and lots of uh, aviation um, experience and expertise. And we have Jonathan over at Zolio as well. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to ask the two of you to introduce yourselves uh, as well. I, I know that uh Jonathan is definitely here to support any questions that you have from Zolio, and uh, Eric is, is here mostly to share his experience of using the, the the product as well. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then I'll take it over. Sure, yeah. I'm Jonathan Sad. Uh, like Sharon said, I'm with Zolio. I'm our VP of Sales and Business Development and have been, you know, working with uh, – Zolio is a uh, – it's a relatively new product. We've been out for two and a half years and we've seen a lot of success and helped a lot of people out in this segment. And we're excited to share you, share more about it today. Awesome. And I'm uh, my name is Eric Hayes. Some of you might know me as a SoCal Flying Monkey, which is a ridiculously silly name, but um, it is what it is. I am a private pilot um, based in Los Angeles in the United States. And um, I fly a Cherokee 6 um, instrument rated and uh, for work, I'm a professional cinematographer, and I started a YouTube channel, which was like the first video was the renovation of my Cherokee 6. It got some traction. The YouTube channel sort of grew. So I'm doing it for fun, doing it just to share my aviation experiences with people and our family adventures. That's what the channel is all about. And 
I kind of stumbled across the Zolio device on a mountain flying and camping weekend uh, adventure uh, from another pilot and saw it and wanted to know all about it. Decided it looked like it would be really useful for me and the kind of flying that I do. Um, and since, have since been using the Zolio um, and really enjoy it, think it's super useful. So I'm just here to share my experience with it and uh, you know, give you guys some information about what it is, how it's beneficial to a pilot and how I use it. So yeah, I guess um, I guess I should just jump right in. Yeah, these are the you start the presentation here. Great. Yeah. So there's there I am with my Cherokee Six, and um, I'm a big mountain biker. I like to go on hikes and mountain bike adventures. So this Zolio fits right in with with that kind of stuff. Um, I'll give you kind of an overview of what what this actually is. The Zolio is a satellite messenger and locator. I think it's an essential kit for pilots. Uh, when I, like I said, when I saw it, I thought it was going to be super useful. I got one and turns out I use it all the time. I'm a huge fan of it. Um, and kind of the top level view of what it does is it'll, it allows you to, it has a, a bunch of cool features. One of them is text. You can text in the plane at any altitude. It uses a satellite network to text. Um, it has a life-saving emergency locator feature, like an SOS button, and it does location tracking like uh, sort of like breadcrumbs. And I'm gonna jump into these features specifically, but this is the top level overview of that stuff. Okay, the way that it does it is it uses the Iridium satellite network, which is the largest and most advanced network of satellites. And you can get coverage, satellite coverage with the Zolio, it covers every inch of the planet. So even if you're in the middle of the ocean somewhere, you will be able to get a message out, get an SOS out. And I'll walk you through how that stuff works and how it's useful. So the first, the first thing is uh, texting uh, at altitude. So uh, as you all know, when you're flying, uh, sometimes it's really hard to get any kind of cell phone connection, uh, especially at the higher altitudes, 8,000 feet, 10,000 feet. Frequently, I'm cruising at those altitudes and I want to be able to contact people or message, let, let them know where I am if I had to divert or I just had a trip recently where we were going up to the Gorge Amphitheater to see my favorite band over Labor Day. And I had another pilot who was I was going to be meeting at the venue. He was flying in and he was already on the ground and he was texting me basically pyreps for his route, which was similar to my route, telling me where the smoke was from the fires and we were coordinating the rest of our day. So I was able to text him at up to 13,000 feet um, and it works. It worked great. It does work great. Uh, I've tested it out. Um, all around, um, you know, my routes of flight, which are really the Western United States and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, the way the texting works is Zolio gives you a custom SMS number and a custom email. So you can send a, an SMS message or an email with the Zolio app. And it provides a really familiar texting experience. Here's like a screenshot of the app. It looks and feels just like um, SMS texting. You can use your contacts from your phone book in there. You just start typing the person's name and it populates and then you can, you can uh, text them right away. Uh, you can use somebody's email address also and it will show up in their email inbox or it'll show up as an SMS text message if you, you sent it as an SMS message to their phone number. So on your recipients end, it's all the same kind of thing. They can reply. They can keep your Zolio number to send you messages at any time. Um, one thing that I love about the Zolio device and the way that it works is that it always sends messages the cheapest available way, meaning that when you're on the phone and it's connected to the Zolio device, it will try to send your message or email using Wi-Fi if it's available, and it'll try to send it, uh, if Wi-Fi is not available, it'll try to send it over the cell network. And if that's not available, then if either of those two aren't available, then it will send it over the satellite. So this accomplishes basically two things. It saves on the number of messages that count against your monthly allotment of messages. And it also provides a really seamless experience because you can have the Zolio device off at any time. And still, if you're in Wi-Fi or cell, you can still be texting somebody from your Zolio number and you'll receive the messages. They won't count against your, your uh, allotment of messages. And then when you turn the device on, if it can still get to Wi-Fi or cell, it will still use it. But once you get out of that cell or Wi-Fi range, it switches over seamlessly 
and uses the satellite. So you get in the plane and you go up high and then you're still texting and you don't even know, it just has done it automatically where it's switched over if the device is on. So it's just a really amazing seamless experience where you're always able to get a message out or receive messages. You're not waiting to turn the device back on again sometime when you're on the ground or have to worry about it. You just get the messages. It's totally seamless. Um, another really cool feature, this is, by the way, um, all these images are from a video that I did where I use the Zolio in flight and I show all the features of it on a flight to Catalina. So if you're interested in sort of like the movie version of what I'm doing here, um, it's it's really fun. I take my mountain bike and ride around on the mountain bike, show you all the, the features of it. And that's on my YouTube channel. Uh, but this feature where we can check in once we land, this is me landing here at Catalina on runway 22. Um, the Zolio has a really cool check-in button feature where after, this is how I use it. Is it. You can use it any any way that you like, but how I use it is after I land, instead of taking out my phone, going to an app, going to search for some, you know, typing somebody's name in and a message, I just want to let my wife know that I've landed and I'm okay. All I do is press this one button, the check-in button on the Zolio, and it automatically sends a message that says, I'm okay, and my location with up to five pre-selected contacts. So I've got my contacts in there that I like to notify. If I'm doing like hopping different airstrips on the backcountry or whatever, and I want to just you know, let somebody know where I've gone, when, where, where I'm at, that I've landed okay. It's just so easy to do. I keep it clipped to my belt. As I'm getting out of the plane, I just push the button and I know they're going to get the message. I don't have to fuss with it. So I really love that feature. Uh, this is what it looks like on the recipient's end when they get the, when they receive the message, it has a little map with your location and it says, I'm okay. So that's really cool. Um, the other feature that is super useful for, for the Zolio is this one button SOS emergency response. Well, whenever I'm flying, I'm always thinking of where I'm gonna land if there's any kind of an emergency. In the back of my mind, I'm always doing contingency planning uh, and having, I'm a firm believer in having that, it, that a pilot should have uh, either a messenger locator device like the Zolio or a PLB, something that will get help to come because if you have to put the airplane down force landing in a field or in a forest or in the water, you have to ditch in the water, you want to be able to get help uh, as soon as possible. And having a device like this can actually save your life. It's a, it's a huge feature. And the Zolio has a one button um, SOS emergency response where you push the button and help will be on the way. Now it'll send your GPS position to an emergency response team through, I think it's the geo uh, service and help will come. It doesn't really stop there because it is also a, a satellite messenger. So you can receive confirmation back that your SOS was received. And you can also get progressive SOS updates if you have your phone connected to the device at the time. You can message with emergency responders and let them know the nature of your emergency, any details about your specific location, or if you're going to be moving or any, any other information, you can imagine the different scenarios, how messaging with the responders could be really useful and way more useful than just your location. So that's a great feature. Um, if you don't have your phone, your phone was damaged when you put the airplane down or it's out of batteries, that's okay because the Zolio has a, the SOS feature is a standalone SOS feature where you push the button. That's, that's really all that you need to do. Um, the two-way communication is definitely bonus, but it does not require the phone to, to use. Another uh, feature that's great um, is the Location Share Plus, which is like a, kind of like a breadcrumb feature. Here I am riding around Catalina. And um, if you're going on like a backcountry hike or you're going from one airstrip to the other in the backcountry, or you just want somebody to know your location as you're moving, you can turn this on and choose an interval from six minutes to four hours, and it'll share your location at, at every time during that interval. So every six minutes or every 12 minutes or every, whatever you determine, will it'll share your location with somebody. And the sending of that works totally independent of the phone. So you don't have to have your phone connected or, uh, or on or anything. Uh, you just have to have the Zolio powered on and turn the location share on, which you can do from the, um, the device itself by holding down that check-in button. 
The other way to turn it on is to use the app. And this is what it looks like where you can select the interval in the app and turn the location share session on. I rode down to the beach and I turned the location share on. I rode back up to the airport. And, um, and then this is what it looks like on the recipient's end where they see your different positions, you know, and the, the different times where you were. And they can kind of click through this interactive map. So it's really user-friendly on their end. Uh, they just need the Zolio app to be able to look at that, which is free. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, they don't need a Zolio, um, device or anything. They just open the app and it's there. It's, it's great. Um, one final feature is there also, uh, is a weather feature with the Zolio through the app. It's a hyper-local weather forecast. It uses just one of your allotted messages to, um, get a localized weather forecast over the satellite. So anywhere you are, you can check the weather hourly forecast for 44 hours. Or um, it also include a five-day forecast, temperatures, wind, direction, speed, precipitation type, and probability. Uh, just kind of like a basic standard weather forecast here. You can see I got it for Avalon, and um, it shows up in a really nicely displayed here. Uh, the Zolio battery lasts for 200 hours in standby mode, which is a really long time. You can imagine you can turn this thing on, go on a five-day camping trip, and never have to really think about it, turning it off, on or off. 200 hours is quite a long time. Uh, the battery is internal and rechargeable, so you just plug it in once in a while, top it off, and then you're good to go. I mean, I, I don't think I, you know, I turn the Zolio on when I'm flying here an hour or two there. You know, I've had a five-hour flight, but that's, you know, some pilots will only fly 100 hours in a whole year, so you don't have to charge the Zolio that often if you're just using it in the airplane or uh, as a contingency. So um, battery lasts for a really long time. It's a great advantage. Um, yeah, that's really it. Those are all the awesome features that I, I like. I think it's such an essential thing to have. This or a PLB can really save your life. The Zolio has so many awesome features with the additional texting, and I, I use it all the time. You'd be surprised that all the different use cases that you can find for texting somebody in the airplane for information that you need to know. Like I texted my wife, hey, can you check if this FBO in Texas actually has fuel because we're diverting? And I want to make sure they have fuel, but I can't call them. I'm at 10,000 feet. So I texted her. She called the FBO. Do you guys actually have fuel? And she texted me back. Yeah, they actually have fuel. So we decided to go to that particular airport and divert there. Um, so lots of, lots of great reasons to have it. If there, I guess if there are any questions, Sharon, is this the time where we're taking questions? Yes, sir. I'm back. Uh, there's, there's a, you know what? There's a lot of uh, Zolio users in the audience today, so let's get to, to see. Uh, I would say that there's a general question on how it's comparable to its competitors. I, I won't specify which competitors. I'll, I'll leave that with you of, of uh, the different functions that makes it stand out. Yeah, I think. Well, John could probably speak to the specific features. I do know that there's, I have a Patreon group um, and we were talking about the Zolio on our discord. And one person in particular said they had the, a competitor, the inReach, and he was waiting half an hour for mess. Like a message finally came in days later and he just last week got the Zolio and he's testing them side by side. And he said that the Zolio is getting the messages reliably like at, at every minute. So just one little data point, but I think John can address the- We have the, actually heard that quite a bit, but we don't have anything official statements on that. But, uh, you know, it's um, a couple of the key points against a lot of our competitors is, uh, the first and foremost is you get a unique phone number, right? So when you sign up for a Zillio, you're going to get a dedicated Canadian phone number that you can hand out to your friends, your family, your loved ones. And they can store that number as your Zolio contact number, and they can contact you at any time. Whether the Zolio device is on or not, if they send a message to that phone number, it's going to come into the app if you're on cellular or Wi-Fi, or it'll come over satellite through the Zolio device if it's on and needs to. Um, so it, that is different than an inReach, where an inReach, you, uh, the inReach user actually has to send a message first, and then somebody can reply to you. So... Um, I guess, again, so that's unique so that people can actually reach out to you if they need to get a hold of you, like while you're up in your plane or, or beyond cell coverage. So that's one. The other is what Eric touched on is the least cost routing, which really does save you a lot of money. 
So if you're out and you're flying and your phone has cell signal, it's gonna send the messages over that cellular channel. Um, and it only sends over satellite when there is no other cellular or Wi-Fi available. So uh, because it's the satellite messaging that's the expensive part. So it's, uh, it's only gonna do that when it needs to. Um, so those are, those are a couple of the high level things. That and, the, and I'll, again, it's got a 200 hour battery life, the highest IP rating. Um, so it's, it's um, I do feel like I'm forgetting something else, but those are the most important ones. <laughs> Very good. There, there are plenty of questions on the pricing. Um, yeah. Someone had kindly posted the plan, so uh, yeah. it's <laughs> it's nice to it's nice to see that uh, there's a subscription option as well. Yep, yep. Uh, twenty five dollars, uh, two hundred sixty nine retail, and uh, twenty five dollars a month for the base plan. And um, yeah, and after the first three months, you can turn that on and off monthly as you need it. So we kind of have an initial three month term. But then after that, if you're not going to be out for a while, you can you can turn it off or suspend it and then just turn it on for the months that you need it. And you can move it up and down plans uh, month to month as well. So we try and make it as flexible and easy as possible for the consumers. Excellent. Now, I know that uh, other options out there, they give aviation weather. Um, Zolio does give weather information. Uh, do, do you know what the source is for that weather information? Uh, it is currently dark sky, but we're moving to Eris weather uh, in the coming weeks. I'm not sure uh, if you guys are familiar with that one, but yeah, AERIS is the will be our weather provider for the uh, local weather. Okay, and you're located here in. Canada. Uh, Zolio's headquarters is in Toronto. There you go. Yeah. I'm personally in Seattle. Nice. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I personally use Zolio not for flying purposes, but for backcountry flying, uh, uh, camping, and yeah. I, I had a pretty smooth experience with it. Um, there was a question here around the ability to text without a phone. Um, I, I think you could just use the, the check-in and not have your phone with you or? Correct. So if your phone is out of batteries or it's broken or not near you, um, the device has the SOS button. So you can, you know, call for help. Uh, you press that button, somebody's going to come to your location and, and help. Um, the other button is the check-in button, which Eric showed. Uh, that check-in button just sends an I'm okay with your coordinates. Uh, and they'll send a message. You can predefine up to five people to send a check-in message to. Um, you can also put the device in tracking mode without your phone. It's, it's a, you do a long press of the check-in button, and it'll put it into that tracking mode at whatever interval you've set. So uh, there is some utility, but you cannot do custom messages. There is, there is no screen on the device, but that actually is what, you know, multiple things. It helps, uh, it helps it uh, maintain its ruggedness uh, and also helps us keep our costs down. Uh, so. Very good. And I do have a question here. If the Zolio number is the same as the uh, IMEI number, the device number. No, no, no. It, 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 uh, the IMEI number that, yeah, that's kind of the electronic serial number that's within the device. That that's just, that's how, what we use to activate the device, but no, you get a, you will get a, um, a Canadian number for messaging. Yeah, that you can hand out to people. So it is a different number. Once you activate it, you should get that. And I should say you also, when you activate, you can, def you can also, you will also set up your own unique Zolio email address. So you can put it in, you know, whatever your name at Zolio.com. You can also hand that out to people. So people can actually reach you by email and you can reach them by email as well. So it's not just SMS messaging. It's also, you can do short emails. Um, the other nice thing, I guess this was another competitive advantage that I forgot earlier, is uh, is uh, we found that most people have like two, three people that they message with most of the time. And if you have those people that you're communicating with frequently, if they also download the Zolio app for free, we allow you to do 950 character text messages. Uh, even over satellite. And that's the equivalent of about six text messages over um, our other competitors. So um, again, that's another money saving option. So you could, again, 950 characters to do the app to app messaging, as we call it, but it only costs uh, one cost of one message on our platform. 
Very good. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing us, sharing with us uh, one of the options for a uh, personal location device. Uh, is there anything you want the uh, ARCOPA members here to walk away knowing about Zolio today? Um, just that, uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, go check us out, watch some more of Eric's videos uh, on, on the use cases. Um, we think it's a, a great option. It's cost effective and uh, hopefully you never have to use it, but it could save your life. Very handy yeah. for multiple applications. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. Oh yeah, I would just urge every pilot to have some kind of plan like that for um, emergency location. I think it's really important. It goes along with like a, you know, emergency survival backpack with the essentials, fire starter, food and water. I mean, you can research all of that stuff, but having those tools available to you for that eventuality to me is just like another card we can put in the deck to stack it in our favor in case something like absolutely uh it will for sure be on youtube uh we sometimes repost on our on-demand uh tool um but for for now we'll repost there and i'll send out an email to everybody with tonight's recording and I'll also include in the email uh, a youtube link the youtube link to uh the video that eric was referencing so that's that's a wrap folks uh it's been a interesting and informative night with everybody here thank you to to Conrad for a fantastic presentation uh, and to uh, Eric and Jonathan for joining us as well. We'll see you all next month. Hopefully it'll be a seminar on RPAS training for an advanced certification. Uh, and the, the last one of the year will be in November on winter flying. We'll talk about uh, engine preheating, uh, working in unheated hangars and uh, more, more to come with winter flying overall. Thank you and we'll see you soon. Bye.